webinar, let's go ahead and get started. The topics that we'll cover today will include a little bit of information on air-powered pumping components, a little principles of operation, how air-powered pumps work. We'll discuss some of the features and advantages of air-powered pumps over other types of pumps for remediation and landfill applications. Then we'll go into the factors that affect pump performance, things such as uh, flow rate and lift and so on. Determining air system requirements for air-powered pump systems, the types of compressors and air dryers used. I'll discuss air and liquid tubing and hose selection, and then I'll go over a few different accessories that can be used to improve pump performance and improve serviceability and reliability. At the end, I'll have a couple of uh, shots of some special pumps that are used for challenging applications. So first, let's go over quickly just what some of the air-powered pump components are. Air-powered pumps are quite simple by design. Essentially, air pressure applied to the pump drives liquid to the surface in a cyclic fashion. The, the pump will fill and discharge. I'll grab my pen here and just give you an idea of some of the components. Uh, mainly, what we're looking at here, we have an air supply that goes into the pump here and an air exhaust that comes out of the pump. So the air supply line goes down to the pump body in this area and then the exhaust will come out here. So no air is exhausted in the well unless we choose to put it there. The pump body itself, right here, essentially is nothing more than a canister with an inlet check valve at the bottom and a discharge check valve at the top. So when it fills with air, I'm sorry, when it fills with water, we simply use air pressure to, uh, to drive the liquid to the surface. So this is how an automatic air power pumping system works. Essentially, we have two cycles, a discharge cycle, during which we apply air pressure to dr drive the liquid out, and then a, a fill cycle, where the pump fills under hydrostatic pressure. As you'll notice, as the, as the pump is discharging, liquid's being driven to the surface and the float is dropping. When the float gets to the bottom of its travel, it'll actually trip the actuator rod, and then what it'll do from there is allow the op open the air valve and allow air pressure to be applied to the pump, so drive the, to the surface. So what we're looking at right now, there's the fill cycle, trip the valve, the valve is open, air pressure applied, driving the liquid to the surface, bottom of the travel, trip the valve mechanism the other direction, then the pump can fill again. And essentially, this will continue to repeat itself as long as there is enough liquid in the well to reach the float above the actuation point. And that's right here. So as long as the liquid rises above this point in the well, then the pump will actuate. Once it drops below that point, the pump will just sit there with the air valve mechanism closed until the liquid level reaches a high enough point to, to hit that actuation point again, then it will go back into operation. A couple of the features of air power pump systems that are unique to their design. First, the inlet and discharge check valves have very large clearances. They're, the passages are designed to handle solids. So silt and sand and even small gravel that can get into the pump can actually be passed through the inlet check valve, through the discharge, and all the way up to the surface. Because the parts within the pump move at relatively low speed, generally no more than anywhere from maybe 30 to 40 cycles per minute maximum, the, the parts uh, have minimal wear on them as, a, as opposed to high-speed rotating impellers or other sliding shafts. Because we have an actuation point in each pump that can be where the pump can be set in order to turn on and off at a specific point in the well, in essence, we have built-in on-off level control. That eliminates any need to have any sort of separate level sensors, either air type or electronic, that would turn the pump on and off. The use of air pressure to drive the liquid out of the pump is a very gentle pumping action. And because of that, we can reduce foaming in landfill leachate, minimum, minimize discharge line clogging, at the same time improve pump performance, especially with very thick or viscous liquids. The pumps have a bottom inlet, and that allows for pumping down to very low liquid levels. By comparison, pumps such as electric submersible pumps, where their inlet is typically toward the middle or top of the pump, we may require several feet of liquid in order, to actu in order to operate the pump correctly. An air-powered pump can actually operate down to about 12 inches or 30 centimeters of liquid depth. Because we have a lot of flexibility in the materials that can be used to construct the pump body and other components, 
the wide range of materials allow us for a wide range of applications. We can handle low pH applications, high chlorides, high temperatures, and other challenging applications that traditional water pumps can't handle. The pumps can be configured to match your specific application. As I mentioned, there's bottom inlet designs, and those can be used for pumping total liquids from a well. Uh, for example, in a remediation application, we may pump out both uh, contaminated water and possibly hydrocarbons or, or, or Dean Apple. And we also have maximum solids handling capability with those bottom inlet pumps. But there are also top inlet pump designs. And the top inlet pump designs essentially are a modification of the bottom inlet where we have these top inlets here, these can specifically be used to handle light hydrocarbon removal. So if we have a well where we have a, a layer of hydrocarbon or petrol floating on the, on the water surface in the well, this top inlet pump will take in the hydrocarbon from the top, and so the bottom here at the, at the end is closed, and the discharge is out the top as well. Longer pumps provide the highest flow rates, while the shortest pumps provide the maximum drawdown in a liquid column, down to that 12 inches or 30 centimeters. Standard diameters will fit into 4 inch or 100 millimeter casings, while smaller diameter bodies will fit into either smaller casings, such as 2 inch, 50 millimeter, or we may have a larger casing, such as 4 inch, 100 millimeter, that has a, a restriction in it, such as a crack, a kink, or deformation in the casing. So many times we can use these smaller pumps, as shown here, we can use these smaller pump designs to get into these either restricted casing areas or into smaller diameter casings altogether. So some of the advantages of air-powered pumping systems, they're designed specifically to handle aggressive fluids, high solids, and elevated viscosity, whereas standard water pumps are not. They don't require cooling. And that's very important when it comes to not only pumping higher temperature fluids, but even pumping for long periods of time or at high lifts. The pumps are designed to operate at temperatures as high as 212 to 250 degrees, depending on material selection, which means that these pumps can be used for certain applications. A landfill leachate, which can actually exceed 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 65 to 70 degrees C. We can actually handle applications in remediation, such as steam or hot air injection, in order to try to mobilize heavy hydrocarbons. There we can get up in that range of 212 to 250, or 100 to 120 degrees C. As I mentioned, they have built-in level and flow control, so there's no level sensors or electronic controls mounted at the surface. The very gentle pumping action of the mechanism minimizes foaming of pump liquids. Using air power out at the wellhead is safer than electricity in either wet environments or potentially explosive environments such as pumping from landfill gas wells. Low speed moving parts minimizes wear, me meaning we have longer pump life. Pump materials can be configured for specific applications as well as the designs and the inlet configurations. And these pumps, because of all these features, actually have a very long warranty. From QED, the pumps have a five year standard warranty. Complete systems are generally available from a single source, so you don't have to go to multiple vendors to get your discharge line, your well cap assembly, and so on. You can buy these things as a complete system. The two biggest limitations with air-powered pumps as compared to, say, traditional water well pumps, the maximum flow to these pumps is around 13 to 15 gallons per minute, or 50 to 60 liters per minute. If your application requires significantly greater pumping volume than that, or pumping rate, I should say, then you may want to consider using a, another type of pump. However, say, for example, 10 gallons per minute running around the clock will give us almost 15,000 gallons of pumped liquid in a day. And the advantage of air-powered pumps is that they can run continuously without overheating. So many times this limitation of 13 to 15 gallons per minute maximum flow isn't truly a limitation in many applications. The other consideration is that these pumps do use compressed air as a power source. And that is, unfortunately, less energy efficient than electric pumps are. So with that, I have a poll question to ask the audience today. I'd like to launch my first poll here if I can. What type of pump do you prefer to use at your landfill or remediation sites? So the choices that should come up on your screen now would be electric submersible pumps, air-powered automatic pumps, air-driven pistons, electric-driven pistons, or another type of pump if I haven't listed yours here. So if you go ahead and use your cursors, you can click on your, your choice, what type of pump you prefer to use, 
And at the end, I can put the poll results up on the screen in just a minute so everyone can see the results and see not only how they voted, but how your peers voted. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the polls today. It's always uh, nice to get lots of active audience participation and, uh, and see what everyone's thinking. I'll leave just a few more seconds for everyone to go ahead and cast their votes, and then we'll go ahead and close the poll and put the results on the screen. Okay. So today, 17% uh, prefer to use electric submersible pumps for their remediation or landfill applications. 60% choose air-powered automatic pumps. 17% use air-driven pistons. 3% electric pistons. And 3% other. Okay. Well, thank you very much for participating. We'll have a couple more polls as we go through today. Let's go on and move on to the next part of the webinar. Factors that affect the flow rate. With air-powered pumps, there are three main things that we're looking at. The total head, or the, the, the lift of the, of the liquid from the pump all the way to whatever its eventual point is. The submergence of liquid over the pump. And then the viscosity of the liquid that we're pumping. So the total head actually combines the pump depth itself the discharge line elevation above the well, if we're, say, pumping into a tank or some other uh, you know, pond or treatment system, and then any frictional loss in the piping fittings and in the check valves. So in essence, our total head will be from this point here of discharge all the way up above the well and then into whatever you know, tank or otherwise we're pumping into. The key here is, is that as flow rate, de the flow rate will decrease as the head increases. So the higher head at any given air pressure, our flow rate will go down. If we need a given flow rate at a given head, we generally just incre increase the air pressure to get there. Submergence is the amount of liquid that's above the top of the pump. So from this point here to here is our submergence. This controls the rate at which the pump will fill. So the flow rate will increase as submergence increases. Finally, the viscosity is the thickness of the fluid that we're pumping and its resistance to flow as based on that thickness. The flow rate will decrease as the viscosity increases at any given submergence, lift, and air pressure. So again, if we need a higher flow rate at a given viscosity, we can often just increase the air pressure in order to get the additional flow that we need. Air-powered pumps, because they're cyclic in operation, have a discharge cycle and a refill cycle. During the discharge cycle, we have, we have liquid coming out. During the refill cycle, the pump is, is actually you know, waiting some period of time as it fills. So because of that, we have to look at the average flow rate for these pumps against the instantaneous flow rate. When we're looking at the flow curves for powered pumps, they're based on the average flow rate over some period of time, meaning that it stayed in gallons per minute or liters per minute at a given depth. As we can see in this chart here, for example, if I grab my pen, uh, I can look, for example, at a well that might be, say, 100 feet or roughly about 30 meters deep, and I can go up to this line here for, for using 100 air, uh, PSI air pressure, and I can see that I have roughly about 3 gallons per minute, or roughly about uh, uh, 12 liters per minute of, of flow for this pump. That's the average flow that we would get with that pump. The discharge piping or header sizing that we use for air-powered pumping systems is going to be based on this average flow rate. So in other words, if we had five pumps in the system and we figured the average flow rate was around three gallons per minute, we would size the piping of the system for about 15 gallons per minute. The reason for that is because we're basing it on average flow rate, not instantaneous, because if we have multiple pumps in a system, they're going to be discharging and filling at random. They're not all going to be operating simultaneously. So we don't need to oversize the piping. Now we'll talk about the air system design. There are several criteria for the air system design. The first thing we have to do is determine the air pressure and air flow rate, or the volume of air required, for each pump in the system, and then the total that's necessary for all the pumps. When sizing an air compressor, 
generally want to allow for future expansion of the system if you expect that might happen. A good example of this, uh, whereas a remediation system may have a fixed number of wells, a landfill pumping system where we're either pumping leachate or possibly where we're, we're dewatering landfill gas wells, the, the possibility of adding additional wells is there all the time. So it's less expensive to put in a larger compressor initially if we anticipate adding additional wells than it is to add an entire second compressor system later. You're going to then choose a compressor type based on the air volume that's required, the length of the project, and then also desired maintenance intervals. And I'll go through compressors in some detail in a few minutes. Factor in the air compressor duty cycle. And this is basically how long the compressor can run against how long it has to rest in order to cool. And that will help you determine the total, the, the actual size of compressor. And then from there, based on your site conditions and your climate, determine if an air dryer is required, and if so, how much additional air might be required to operate the dryer, depending on its type. So now we'll go through some of these individual criteria. I'll, I'll give you some information on them. First, the flow rate and air consumption curves. Each pump model has its own flow rate, as I showed you earlier, based on the chart, art, the, and lift and air consumption curves that are based on actual testing. This is really important. Whatever manufacturer you get a pump from, you want to make sure when you're looking at those curves that they're based on actual test data from a, a, an, an actual well, not calculated values that are, used, you know, that are derived from engineering. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the pump flow curve to find the flow rate at a, at a desired depth. So what I might be able to do here, grab my pen, and again, I'll look at this well that's 100 feet deep. And I'm going to operate this thing, let's say, for example, on a 70 PSI air system. So I find this point right here, and I say, okay, I can operate this thing at around 6 gallons per minute, or roughly about 22 liters per minute at this given depth. Okay? So then from there, I can go down to my air consumption chart below. Now, this is probably a little bit hard to see, so uh, just take, take my word on this one. But I'll go back to my 100 feet, and I'll move over right here. And it says that I need roughly about 7 tenths of a CFM of air for every... Um, gallon of water they want to pump. So at 6 gallons per minute, I multiply 7 times 6, I end up with 4.2 standard cubic feet of air per minute that I require for that pumping application. Now from there, if I had 10 pumps in the system, they're all roughly at the same depth, I would say 4.2 times 10, 42 as CFM, and then I would from there go to my compressor duty cycle, and then my air dryer requirements to determine my actual compressor size. So that, that's going to that's be my first step, figuring out the flow rate, the air required at that depth, and then from there calculating the total amount of air required to operate the pumps in the system. From there, I'm going to look at my compressor type. Now, air compressor types generally fall into two categories. We have reciprocating piston compressors and rotary screw compressors. Reciprocating comp pistons are the most commonly used. And they generally cost a little bit less initially. And they actually are slightly more energy efficient than the rotary screws. But they have a lower duty cycle, which means essentially that, generally speaking, it's going to be something around a 50% duty cycle. could be slightly higher for some and some slightly lower for others. They also create a little bit more noise and vibration, and they require more maintenance over time, more frequent oil changes and so on, in order, and, and uh, tank draining to be maintained. By comparison, rotary screw compressors, which are pictured in the lower part of the screen here, they're smaller, they're quieter, they have a 100% duty cycle, which means they run continuously. And they use about 5 to 10% more energy to do this, but they have less maintenance as required, and therefore, over time, the rotary screw compressors generally tend to cost less to operate. And it, when you combine the lower operating cost with the initial capital cost being slightly higher, they're overall a better deal for longer-term applications. As I mentioned earlier, duty cycle is the percentage of time that a compressor can run before it has to shut down to cool, and it's measured in 10-minute increments. So the duty cycle is, is calculated by determining the amount of time that the compressor is on and dividing that by the time on plus the time off. An example of this would be a compressor that can run for 6 minutes and then needs to shut off for 4 minutes in order to cool. So that's 6 divided by 6 plus 4, or 0 0.6. In other words, our duty cycle is 60% meaning that the maximum time that that compressor can run is 60% of the time. And this is important because the sizing of the compressor is going to be based on this duty cycle. 
and as I use my earlier example of like say 10 pumps at 4.2 SCFM, that's 42 CFM, then I would have to divide that by the duty cycle to get the actual CFM. Here in my example, I have a 75 CFM compressor sizing that was required to operate my pumps, right here. I'm going to multiply that by my duty cycle of 60% and end up with 125 uh, CFM compressor size. So that's the key thing. The determination there is what size the compressor has to be, not based just on pump requirements, but on the combination of that and duty cycle. It's also important to note that duty cycle affects, affects compressor sizing, but does not affect energy usage. That's really just a function of runtime. So even though the compressor might have a 40% duty cycle or a 60% duty cycle, it's not any, any more or less energy efficient. It just, when it's running, it's running. When it's off, it's off. With rotary screw compressors, of course, they can run up to 100% of the time, continuous operation as needed. Now, a question that often comes up is, do I require an air dryer for my system? Air dryer determination is really based on where a, a system is located, the climate, and what the relative humidity is. And then, from there, what the operating temperatures will be for the pumping system. So air dryers are designed to remove condensed moisture from the air system. And the purpose of that is to protect the airlines that we have installed out there in the field, fittings, and even pressure regulators from damage either from freezing or by corrosion due to accumulation of liquid over time. Now, it's important to remember that things like piping systems, air piping systems, for example, in colder climates are generally going to be buried. But even then, if it gets extremely cold, the accumulation of liquid in the lines can cause them to freeze, and then the entire pump system can shut down until it can thaw out. Now, generally, it's nice to put an air dryer system on all air-powered uh, pumping systems if, if possible, regardless of, of the climate that you have. However, if you're in an area where you have extremely low humidity, you might be able to get by without it. So, for example, here in the United States, if we're, if we're basically in the southwest area here, where we have hot, dry air, you know, very low humidity, might be able to get by without an air dryer. But if we're going to operate here in the southeastern United States, where it's generally hot and humid, an air dryer is generally required. And also, if you're operating in very cold climates, because of the potential for the condensation to freeze, it's also really important. You might be able to get by in the, in the area here in the center with or without a dryer. It's going to really depend on your conditions. But in general, when in doubt, it's better to default to having an air dryer in the system because the overall performance of the system is likely to be better. Air dryer systems can be two types, refrigerant or desiccant. You're going to select an air dryer that will get you to a dew point temperature of 20 degrees Fahrenheit or 7 degrees C below the minimum operating temperature that you anticipate running the pumps at. Now, the refrigerant dryer systems can get down to about 35 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 degrees C. So, if you're in generally a warm, humid climate where you're not expecting any freezing to occur, that's where refrigerant systems will work. Because, again, we have to get down to the dew point temperature of 20 degrees Fahrenheit below the minimum operating temperature anticipated. So, the refrigerant dryer systems aren't going to work in, in freezing climates. But the nice part of refrigerant systems is they don't consume any air from the compressor. They require no energy to operate from the, from the air system. A desiccant dryer can get down to a drying temperature of minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is also the same as minus 40 degrees Celsius. However, in operation, they consume 15% of the available air from the compressor. For winter climates, the desiccant system is really the only way to go. It's the only way we can guarantee we can get down to those lower temperatures. But we have to keep in mind that when sizing the compressor, we have to size for that dryer. So with that, I have another poll question for the audience. I'd like to know, for air-powered pumping systems, what type of air dryer system do you typically use? So what should pop up on your screen right now is a choice of refrigerant dryers, desiccant dryers, or if you don't use dryers, go ahead and check that answer off. I'll leave a few moments for everyone to jump in and cast their votes, and then we'll put the results back up on the screen so everyone can see. It's always interesting in these polls to see how they stack up over time. 
I like to see uh, whether or not we see a consistent pattern. Generally, these air dryer systems, we do. So let's see how it stacks up today. We have a few more moments for everyone to use their cursors and cast their votes. And then, unlike the state of Florida, we'll have our results instantly. And I, my apologies to everyone from the state of Florida. <laughs> okay, let's close our poll and take a look at our results. So today, we had 26% to prefer or use refrigerant dryers, 37% that use desiccants, and 37% that don't use an air dryer. That's almost the same pattern we've seen in, in the other previous webinars. Roughly one-third, one-third, one-third. Today we've got one-quarter and then a little bit more than a third each for desiccant and not using dryers. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't put the results up on the screen. I apologize for that. I think you can probably see them now. There we go. Apologize for that. 26% refrigerant, 37% desiccant, and 37% don't use air dryer systems. Okay. Thanks for participating in the poll. Let's jump to the next part. I walked you through that entire uh, little process of calculating how we determine the air system requirements. And it's important to understand it. But from there, QED has developed a tool to kind of simplify that whole process for you for their pumps. So for our example here, if our compressor were to run for six minutes and then shut down for four to cool, that would be six divided by six plus four, or 0 0.6, meaning we have a 60% duty cycle. Typically, we want to be for reciprocating piston pumps in a uh, range of about 50 to 80% duty cycle. They can run as low as 15% or as high as 100 on some reciprocating pistons. Rotary screws have a 100% duty cycle, which means they operate continuously. The point of all this duty cycle discussion is that we have to make sure that whatever air sizing requirement we have, we factor that in to determine the, the, the size of the compressor actually required in a reciprocating piston compressor. So for example, if we had a 75 CFM air requirement and we had a 60% duty cycle, we would have to divide 75 CSM by 0.6 and come up with 125 CFM or cubic feet per minute of air required to run the system. Now it's important to remember also that duty cycle affects just the sizing of the compressor, but actually whether the compressor is larger or smaller doesn't affect the energy consumed. The energy consumed is only a function of run time and the amount of air produced. A question that often comes up is, do I really need an air dryer for my system? The purpose of an air dryer is to keep moisture, condensed moisture, from the air system out of the air lines, the fittings, the pressure regulators, and, and other portions of the system to keep them from either being damaged by corrosion or causing problems with pumps not functioning due to freezing. And we can see liquid accumulation in low spots in the air system. We can also see it build up in filter regulators and other portions of the system. So if you look at this map down here at the bottom, Generally speaking, you're going to want to use an, an air dryer in any system that falls probably in these three areas. If it's very cold, where we're going to get freezing temperatures, this area is going to be included in North, in North America or the United States. We get down in this mixed humid area here, we may or may not require an air dryer. But however, we get down into the hot humid requirements, er, I'm sorry, areas here, these climates, and you're, you're going to want to use an air system in all these areas right here. Now the only area that might be excluded from really requiring an air system would be the west and southwest of the U.S., where typically we have hotter and drier air, so we don't have very much condensation in the air compressor system. An air dryer system should typically be used in any climate where we expect to see temperatures below 32 degrees. Now, there's two types of air dryer systems that will remove moisture for this, from the system from us. The refrigerant air dryer and the desiccant air dryer. When you're selecting an air dryer, you need to pick one where the dew point temperature of 20 degrees Fahrenheit below the minimum operating temperature anticipated is achieved. So if, if, for example, if you expect to hit an air temperature of, say, 40 degrees, you would want to pick a, if you had a dew point temperature, I'm sorry, if you dew point temperature of 40 degrees, uh, you'd want to pick a system that would get down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It had to be 20 degrees below that. Refrigerant type dryers are capable of drying air down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit and don't require 
any air from the compressor system to operate them. So typically we'll see the refrigerants used in warmer climates or humid climates where we don't expect any freezing conditions because essentially we can only get down to 35 degrees with these, with these, with these dryers. When we get into cold weather applications, we go to the desiccant systems. These can go all the way down to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is also minus 40 degrees Celsius. However, the desiccant type system uses air to operate. It consumes air, about 15% of the available air. So we have to factor that in when sizing the compressor. So from there, I have another polling question for you today. If you, for air power pumping systems, what type of air dryer system do you typically use? On the screen, you should see three choices pop up in just a second. If you use a refrigerant dryer, mark that. If you use desiccant dryer, mark that. Or if your system doesn't use an air dryer system, uh, go ahead and check that off as your answer. And then we'll take a look at the results in just a few moments. Again, I thank everyone for participating in the polls. We'll leave a few more seconds so that everyone can get their answers in, and then we'll go ahead and put the results up on the screen. Okay. Let's take a look at our results. So today, about a quarter of the audience, 27%, use refrigerant dryers. 33% using desiccants, and then adding that up together, 40% don't use an air dryer system. Actually, that's the lowest number on 40%. Typically, we see about half, pe half the people. So uh, congratulations to this audience for being diligent and using the, those, uh, those systems. Let's go ahead and move on with the next part of the webinar here. Let's talk about the flow rate and air consumption calculator. I showed you earlier how to use the flow curves and air consumption charts in order to determine the compressor sizing for your system. The QED has a live tool that works out on their website that can help you determine for any QED pump that you might be using the air system requirements for your system. It lets you put in factors for well depth and other things. Let's go ahead and see if we can launch the live system today. And your screen should change in just a second. And you'll see the actual air consumption calculator. So here what I can do is I can go ahead and start by selecting a pump type. Maybe I'll just say go ahead and check a AP4 plus bottom inlet, long body. And what that does then it automatically calculates the air consumption required per pump for a given uh, pump depth and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and set this pump at 50 feet of depth. So I go to my calculator here and just type in 50. And now it's showing me that my maximum flow rate will be about 11 gallons per minute under these conditions. And then from there, with, if, if I have a desired flow rate that's lower, I can change that. So even this pump can operate at 11. Let's say for my application, I only need 5 gallons per minute maximum. I'll go ahead and put in 5. That changes the air consumption now to roughly about 3 CFM for this per pump. Now in this application, if I say, for example, that I'm going to have 15 pumps in my system, it's going to go ahead and say that I'm going to require a total air consumption of all, for all the pumps of 44 CFM. Then I can look down below here in this part of the table, and let's see if my highlighter will work here, but what I can do is look down in this area right here. I guess I can't leave a highlight on this screen. But you can see that then what it does is it shows me with and without a dryer what my, my air consumption would be. So if I had the type of dryer uh, that was a desiccant, it would, it would consume some of the air. And also then for reciprocating compressors versus rotary screw, reciprocating having a duty cycle average of, of about 50% is calculated here, with that would term, determine the compressor size. So you see based on 44 CFM, without a dryer we'd be at 97, so we'd probably round that up to 100, and with the dryer 111, which probably would round up to a, a 125 CFM compressor, a typical size. Whereas if we were using a rotary screw without a dryer, we'd be at 44, I'm sorry, 48, which would round up to about 50, or 55, which would probably round up to either a 60 or 75 CFM compressor. Okay, so that just shows you this tool, and by the way, if you want to find this tool on the QED website, you can look over here, and you'll see a bar across the top for tools, and you'll go down to the flow rate and air consumption calculator. Okay, let's go back to our webinar and talk about discharge line sizing. 
This charge line sizing for these pumps is typically either one inch or one and a quarter inch, meaning 25 or 32 millimeter OD tubing. And this is tubing, so it's sized by its OD. And these are the most common sizes used for air-powered pumping systems. The larger diameter tubing costs a little bit more money, but it actually provides two advantages. It has higher flow rate maximum from the pump, and actually lower air consumption per gallon or liter liquid pumped. And the reason for the lower air consumption, interestingly enough, is that there's less resistance to flow. Any tubing that's down well typically is going to be those sizes. Any surface tubing from there is typically going to be a UV resistant nylon or HDPE tubing that can either be laid on the surface at a site or can be trenched in or inside of a conduit or otherwise. To determine surface discharge pipe sizing as well as the airline diameter and other features in the system such as valves, elbows or bends or whatnot, the most efficient way these days to determine those si that sizing is to use an online pipe flow calculator. And I've provided a couple of examples here. Uh, freecalc.com and pipeflowcalculations.com are particularly good websites for doing this. And it allows you to calculate many things in there, including shutoff valves or swing check type check valves that might offer some flow resistance, elbows, bends, and whatnot. A question that often comes up is, should I use jacketed tubing, which is actually plastic material, or rubber hose, which is basically an industrial type rubber hose? You see pictures of both on the right-hand side of the screen. Jacketed nylon 12 tubing has a few advantages. The lines are all bundled together. If you take a close look at the photograph, you'll see here that you have the individual lines, like here, here, and here, but then we have a sheath around the outside of the lines that actually makes them like a single unit. These tubings may, uh, are easier to manage with the sheath on the outside. They can also handle higher temperatures. They're rated to 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 80 degrees Celsius maximum. Have very high chemical resistance to most organics. They're very lightweight, yet actually stronger than hose. They don't kink easily, partly because the tubing is, is, less, is more resistant to kinking, but also because we have that, that sheath on the outside. And it's actually about 40% lower cost than rubber hose. So jacketed nylon 12 tubing costs the least, takes the most heat, it's the strongest, has a lot of chemical resistance. It's used in most applications. However, in certain applications, especially where we're doing hydrocarbon type remediation, it can be common to use fuel resistant industrial rubber hose. A couple of advantages here, it has a greater bend radius than tubing. And the reason it gets used commonly in like say hydrocarbon cleanup sites like gas station cleanups or, or refineries or terminals, is that we may have a need to move the pump up and down based on seasonal changes in water level or other things, or you know, long-term remediation of the system with liquid levels changing. So the need to reposition the pump with the rubber hose, we can coil up some hose inside the vault box at the surface, whereas with the nylon tubing, there's really no good way to coil it. It's actually more flexible in very cold weather applications. It's easier to remove from barb fittings if that's necessary. It's resistant to most solvents and fuel additives, though I caution that you make sure that you get an industrial rubber hose that's rated for certain chemical resistance, but not just the inside diameter of the hose. The outside jacket of the hose itself has to also be chemically resistant or rated, and that's very important to, to specify. We typically use this then because, in, in, for the reason in, in groundwater remediation applications. Now, for those of you that are used to doing pump service or have had experience in the field with air-powered pumps, you know that maintenance often requires removing the tubing from the pump in order to service the pump itself. Where we've used barb fittings in the past, removing the tubing generally meant cutting off the tubing at the top of the pump just above the barb and then cutting it away from the barb and removing the clamp. Well, it can be difficult to do that. It takes some time. There's a safety risk, of course, in using a blade or cutter. And every time we do this, we shorten the length of the tubing by, say, 2 to 3 inches or 5 to 8 centimeters. So it means over time we're changing the pump position in the well. Because of this, for sites that require more frequent pump maintenance, QED developed something called an easy fitting, which is a high flow, quick connect type of fitting with, with quick release retainer clips. So when you take a look at the fitting itself here, the fitting is actually the barb portion plus the lower half of the body. 
And then we've got these little retainer clips that snap in place that hold the two halves of the, of the fitting together. Down below, you'll see this is the, the uh, base part of the, of the fitting. It fits into the pump body. And then these are the pieces that are attached permanently to the end of the tubing line. They have a double Viton O-ring seal, as shown here. And then those retainer clips, which can be pulled out, are what we use to just basically separate the, the, the uh, tubing and that upper half of the easy fitting from the body and the lower half of the easy fitting. These easy, fit, easy fittings are fairly inexpensive upgrade, um, less than about $150 compared to the standard stainless steel barbed fittings. And it can save a lot of time in field and also end up costing a lot less money than conventional quick connect fittings that can be bought in the aftermarket. Support ropes and cables. Support ropes and cables are recommended for applications where we anticipate that the well might silt in or that the pump can become stuck or sandlocked. We generally prefer to use stainless steel cable as shown uh, in, in these diagrams. However, we often see, in, in, especially in hydrocarbon type applications, uh, ni nylon rope being used as an anchor material. For sites where you might be, say, for example, using a soil vapor extraction system or collecting landfill gas under vacuum, it's not uncommon for the completion at the top of the wellhead to be a flange type well cap as opposed to a fern coat type or rubber coupling type of cap. The thing about flanges is they require bolts around the edge of the flange to seal the flanged cap or lid to the flange base. These can be uh, zinc or, or CAD plated stainless steel, I'm sorry, CAD plated steel bolts or they can be stainless steel bolts. But the galvanized or plated bolts corrode and stainless steel bolt, thre bolt threads can gall or seize. So for those of you that spent time in the field, you know that oftentimes bolted flanges, if they need to be opened for pump maintenance, can be quite time consuming to get at. Many times we'll have bolts freeze up and the only way to open the flange is to actually cut the bolt off. And that can mean some time spent in the field, uh, considerable cost. In some cases where these flanges are located down inside vault boxes, it can be very difficult or almost impossible to get at the bolts to even cut them off. QED developed something called an easy bolt that fits into a standard flanged hole and is tightened by a simple lever action. So it's just like an over center clamp. The lower half of the bolt, which is right here, drop, it toggles actually so that it drops down straight through the flange hole. And then we push down on this handle part here in order to provide the clamping force. Compared to using an, a typical eight bolt flange, only four easy bolts are required for typical six and eight inch flanges to provide enough clamping force to get a good seal on the gasket. The cost of the easy bolt system compared to say stainless steel bolts can be just roughly about twice the cost of the bolts, but the advantage is that if we even have to cut off one set of the bolts, we've paid for the easy bolt system. I'm sorry, the, yes, we paid for it, right. Okay, air filter and pressure regulators are commonly used in these systems. The filter regulator is installed at each well and it does two things. It protects the pump and air valve from large solids that might have gotten into the air system. Now, if we have a typical air system with a filter back at the compressor, of course, that's going to keep out most of the particulate matter. But there's always the chance that we might pick up solids when air systems are installed as the, as the air lines are, say, dragged through conduit or trenched in. And any time the pumps are actually maintained where we, where we disconnect the air hoses at the wellhead, we may end up getting solids or dirt inside the tubing. So the pressure regulator is there to catch those large solids and protect the pump. It also allows us to adjust the flow rate of the pump individually, well by well. If we've got a given system air pressure, say for example 100 PSI or pound per square inch air, we can regulate the pressure at the well using the pressure regulator system and then either increase or decrease the flow of a given pump at a well. These systems also trap moisture, and typically they have an auto drain here down at the bottom, so any moisture that might coalesce inside the filter is occasionally pulsed out of the system by air. Cycle counters can be used to determine flow rate in these pumps, uh, and, may, and estimating, essentially estimating the liquid flow rate by counting the cycle of the pump. Air-powered automatic pumps should generally discharge the same volume with each cycle of the pump, so if we know that volume, say it's three quarters of a gallon per minute, and we count cycle times, we end up with say 100 gallons, or sorry, 100 cycles, we know that we've pumped essentially 75 gallons of liquid. The advantage of the cycle counter over a liquid flow meter 
is that it's on the air side of the system. So it's not subject to any exposure of the liquid we're pumping, say for such, such as leachate or contaminated water. So therefore, there should be no scaling or corrosion, fouling, or other issues that often happen with liquid uh, flow meters and these type of applications. It's also a very handy tool for determining things such as how frequently the pump operates, the relative increase or decrease in flow rate over time by watching cycles and, you know, on, a, on an interval. And it's also very handy for scheduling maintenance based on total cycles of pump operation. Now, certain other accessories that can be very helpful in, in kind of customizing these pump applications, or these pumps for certain applications, I mean, are things such as the slow fill valve. The slow fill valve is installed on the exhaust air line of the pump at the well cap. And it's a, basically a needle valve where we can adjust the exhaust rate of the pump to change the rate at which the pump fills. If we have an open exhaust air line, the pump will fill at whatever rate it can fill at based on submergence over the pump. But if we use a slow fill valve and restrict that, air, that exhaust air, we can reduce the rate at which the pump fills. This can be helpful in extremely low yield wells or in issues in, in wells where higher rates of flow through the well screen or intake could cause an accumulation of silt. It's important to remember that if we use a slow fill valve, the overall rate of the pump, the flow rate of the pump will be reduced because we're extending the fill time on the cycle. Another handy device, especially at landfill sites, is an excess flow valve or an automatic air shutoff valve. The excess flow valve essentially works like a circuit breaker or fuse for applications where we anticipate that an airline could break due to something by being ruptured by a subsurface fire, high temperatures, or physical damage. So in any application where we're concerned about pumping air down into the well, and landfills really fall into this category, especially landfill gas extraction wells where we might be using these pumps to dewater. The valve is actually preset to allow a certain amount of flow through it. For, so for example, if we know that our pump consumes five cubic feet of air per minute, the valve can be preset to say roughly around say seven to 10 CFM of airflow. So as long as the pump is operating under normal conditions, and it uses five, six, seven CFM of air as it's operating, everything will be fine. But if the air line in the subsurface should happen to break, the air flow will accelerate through that line and, and it could increase to say like 15 or 18 CFM and immediately snaps the, the excess flow valve shut and it will magnetically latch. At that point, we can resolve the problem at the site and it would require manually resetting the valve in order to allow the pump to operate again. So it's a, it's a safety feature in that regard. Now let's talk about determining liquid levels in wells. Liquid levels can be measured manually with something like a water level taper meter or a dedicated level measurement system such as a bubbler line or transducer. Using water level meters or tapes or sounders has a lower capital cost, but it requires the well to be open and takes more time. So again, if we're operating a system like a soil vapor extraction system, or if we're operating a system like a landfill gas collection system, we want to maintain vacuum on the system using a dedicated type of air measurement system can eliminate the concern about having to open the well, costs a little bit more, but it can save a lot of labor and pay for itself very quickly. QED has developed a system called an easy level, which is a high liquid level indicator. This is a tool that can be installed on the top of the well head and will actually change color at the top. You see the clear dome in the top will pop up orange if the liquid level in the riser or well exceeds the preset level of the probe down below. This system requires no power whatsoever. It doesn't, in fact, even require an air-powered pump to be installed in the well. It can work in any type of a well, regardless of the pump type, and it uses just a captured bubble inside to actually self-power it. So there's just the air inside the actual probe and tubing is what actually powers the system. A few advantages of the system, it's not affected by foam or vacuum. So under various operating conditions, it only reacts to liquid and, and it's referenced to the vacuum so we get a true liquid level. And if the probe is submerged, we can attach a, a digital level meter or a handheld gauge to actually take a liquid level measurement. Cost of these systems is around $250 per well, so it can very quickly pay for itself in field labor. And the next slide shows you an example of how the easy level system is installed with the indicator at the top of the well head or well cap, connecting tubing, quarter inch nylon tubing down to the liquid probe down below, which is a hollow stainless tube. And it shows an example one installed on a landfill gas extraction well here in this site. To take a liquid level measurement, we can use a digital liquid level measurement system. 
And this can be used with an easy level or just with a single um, drop, drop weight type probe and nylon tubing installed in the well. It has a range of about 100 feet of liquid level, meaning essentially 100 feet of submerges on the probe, and that can be used at any depth. It could be as deep as, say, say 50 to 150 feet, or it could be as much as 500 feet or, or more deeper, but it can handle 100 foot or 30 meters of range on the liquid. Again, the accuracy is not affected by foam in the well or vacuum. And these level probe kits cost about $100 for a 50 foot well, with a digital meter and one, just one required per site at about $1,225. So with that, I've got one more poll question to launch today to ask the audience. And that is, how do you monitor the liquid levels at your site? And your choices are, and this is check all that you've used, or every, every type of system you've used, manual measurement with liquid level probes or, or tapes or sounders, bubble tube systems that are read at the wellhead, transducers with data loggers that are read at the wellhead, automated telemetry systems, or if you don't you measure liquid levels at all in your wells, that would be your choice there. So I'll leave a few seconds for everyone to... Uh, get their votes in, and then we'll take a look at the results together in just a moment. Everyone has had a chance to get their votes in, so let's go ahead and put our results up on the screen. Today, 88% of our audience has tried or used a manual measurement system. 11% have used bubbler tubes. 50% have used transducers. That's actually the highest number we've seen. 16% using automated telemetry type systems that can be read remotely by, via website or otherwise. And 11% said that today that they don't measure liquid levels. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's polls. Let's go ahead and finish up with the last part of our webinar. Let's talk a little bit about actuation point in the well. The actuation point is the liquid level inside the pump that activates the air valve mechanism. And so depending on where we set the pump in the well, the activation point will determine the level to which we pump down in the well, the maximum drawdown. Now if I start this little animation here, you'll see the actuation point is the line right here. And at that point, that's where the pump float has to rise to at that point in the well in order to get the pump to cycle. If the liquid level in the well should drop down below the actuation point, the pump will shut off until the liquid level recovers to the actuation level in the well. Now, how vacuum affects the actuation point is interesting, because in essence, any vacuum applied to the system for soil vapor extraction or landfill gas collection raises the actuation point above the design level when the pump is exhausted outside the well. So what that means is, for example, if we're using a vacuum applied to the system of 20 inches or 51 centimeters, and we had an actuation point of 33 inches for our pump, then that means that the, the, the system essentially will operate at a higher level, higher actuation point. Let's go ahead and start our animation here. And what you'll see here then is that this is our, our actual actuation point, but this is our... our effective actuation point because we have vacuum applied to the system. We're adding 20 inches. So you'll notice before that pump's going to cycle, the liquid level has to reach this point right here before it's going to begin to cycle. So as the liquid level comes up to this purple line here, you'll notice at that point that it rises to that there, it will then begin to cycle in the well. So if we're operating wells under vacuum, our options to maintain the desired actuation point we would exhaust the air line outside the well. I'm sorry, we'd exhaust the air line inside the well in order to, to reference the vacuum. However, if we're operating a system where we don't want to get air into the well because oxygen or nitrogen might affect, uh, to say for example, the quality of landfill gas, we want to exhaust the air line outside the well. That's going to raise our actuation point. So the option that we have, if we need to get the actuation point down low because we need to pump down to a low liquid level, but we have vacuum in the system and don't want air, is to use something called an equalization valve. And this here, let me pop this into slow motion mode and start it. Essentially, the actuation valve is connected to the exhaust line, 
the exhaust line itself, as shown here, will actually be above the cap. So any air exhausting from the system is going to come up through this line. However, there's a small port on the side of the system here that will be referenced to vacuum. And the way the system operates is that when we apply uh, the, whoops, I'm sorry, when we apply the um, vacuum to the system, let me start the animation here, Essentially what happens is the air exhausts out the line, most of the air comes out through the cap, but then a very, very small amount of air is referenced to the well, and that allows the vacuum to apply to the line. So again, about 90% or more of the air will go out the exhaust valve above the cap, and then the equalization valve will allow the vacuum to be referenced to the system so that our actuation point of the pump remains the original design point. Now quickly, I just want to walk you through a few pumps for very specialized applications. High temperature applications with air powered pumps, that's one of the greatest advantages. We can operate the temperatures up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 C for sites such as high temperature landfill leachates, gas well to watering applications, and thermally enhanced remediation sites. High viscosity applications. We can be pumping things such as heavy petroleum hydrocarbons, creosote, or aged or thickened leachate. These are all challenges for traditional submersible pumps, but air-powered pumps can handle liquids as thick as 7,000 centistokes, which would be about as thick as honey might be at room temperature. In order to get the flow that we need, we would have a maximum of about 7 gallons per minute, but we can increase the air pressure applied to the pump system above what we would typically use for thinner liquids like water in order to get uh, the compensation that we need in order to drive these liquids up to the surface. High salinity and extreme pH liquid applications, where we're concerned about corrosion because we have chlorides above 1,000 parts per minute, uh, temperatures greater than 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, pH extremes as low as 1.5 or as high as 13, we can select materials that are either plastic or stainless steel, and we have very specific versions of the pumps, such as the AP4 Plus that's designed for seawater applications, handling uh, as uh, salinity as high as 35 to 40,000 parts per million. If you're working at, at sites, especially landfill sites, where we have highly mineralized leachate, we can often see solids deposits both inside and on the, on the, on the outside of the pump that can actually restrict movement of the parts inside the pump and can, can cause the pump to either slow down or stop. QED has recently developed a system that essentially maintains the operation of these pumps by preventing the solids from building up or hardening any of the pump components. This system is pictured here. This is a small solar-powered external um, control unit that will actually pulse the pump or blow down the system about every 15 minutes in order to prevent solids from building up on the inside of the pump. And it can reduce the required maintenance in a system like this uh, from weekly maintenance or more down to as little as two months or less. This system has been tested now just recently at a couple of landfill sites across the U.S. with great success, and it just shows some of the components of the system. Essentially, it can be retrofit onto an, any existing wellhead by connecting onto the compressed air line and then dr using the green line shown in the lower left uh, to attach to the exhaust air line, and that blows down the pumping system. This type of a pump is called a slider pump, and it's a canister-type pump with surface mounted controls. They look very much like the controls you saw in the last um, image. These are designed for applications where we can't use an automatic air-powered pump because the riser is not vertical. So if we have a sloped or angled riser, these pumps don't operate at very high flow rates, but they can manage about 3,000 gallons per day, or about 11,300 liters per minute, or about 11 cubic meters of, of, of fluid per day. So with that, I'd just like to mention, for any of you that attended today's webinar and might be interested in it, part two of this webinar series, Troubleshooting and Maintenance of Air-Powered Pumps, will be presented on April the 4th, so about uh, just about a month from now. And again, it'll be at the same time, 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, U.S. And with that, I would like to turn everything over to our moderator, Bob, and take any questions that we might have from the audience. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, if you'd like to ask Dave a question, please enter it in the questions panel located to the right of your desktop. We'll try to answer as many of your questions uh, during this period as we can. 
Uh, Dave, we had uh, two questions uh, come in from Robert uh, during the presentation. Uh, uh, the first one is, uh, Robert is asking you to please comment on the origin of air entering the liquid force main discharge pipe. Is the pump the primary source of air entering the liquid discharge force main? Well, Robert, I would have to say that there's a very good chance that the air could be coming from the pump, and there's a certain, there are certain operating conditions that can cause that. We can occasionally have a problem where the air valve mechanism will get stuck between the discharge and refill cycle. So in other words, the air valve mechanism doesn't flip fully all the way to either inlet or intake or exhaust so that the poppets are hanging in between. When that happens, we can actually get air being driven from the system instead of out the exhaust line, some of the air can be driven up the discharge line because we'll push all the liquid out of the pump and at that point we can actually get some overdrive as we call it and push some air into the system. So that's one potential um, source of it. Uh, I have heard of other things that can cause that problem. If you're running into this frequently, I would suggest that if you talk to the folks, if you've got QED pumps of course, I would suggest talking to the folks at QED customer service or tech support and they can probably give you some answers on what might be going on there. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, the second question from Robert, should placement of air release valves on the liquid force main discharge point be at the high points of the force main or the low points to serve most effectively at releasing the slugs of air that become trapped in the liquid force main discharge piping? Uh, Robert, I'm going to have to tell you that I don't have a lot of experience with the installation of air release valves on force mains. Uh, my, my suspicion is that it would be at the high points because that's where you'd expect the air to accumulate. But I can't say that I have any experience with, with that. And again, here's where I'm going to point you toward the experts uh, in application specialists at QED that can help you out either in, in the tech support area or the application specialist. So again, if you look on the uh, slide there, if you contact QED either at the uh, email address there or at one of the two phone numbers, they can probably give you much better information on that. And I apologize for not being able to answer that question today. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, Liz would like to know if there's a way to get the pump counters to work at lower pressures like 20 to 30 PSI. Uh, yes, Liz, there should be. Um, the cycle counters do require some adjustment for certain conditions in the field. There is a procedure in the O&M manual that shows you how to adjust the, uh, the, the cycle counters to make sure that they'll trip at the air pressure that you're operating at. Now, I, I don't really have any experience using them, say, as low as 20 PSI. Uh, many applications, I'm using them at much, much higher pressure. And for what it's worth, uh, the, the pump cycle counter should function under those conditions, but there I'm going to have to be cautious. Uh, when you get down below a certain pressure, it may be difficult to get it to trip every time. So I'll refer you to the O&M manual, which is, if you don't have it handy, should be online on the QD website as a download. You can get the PDF there. And I would refer you again to the uh, customer service or tech support folks at QED at either of those two numbers that might be able to answer the question. If you're running into a problem there, running you through the adjustment procedure first might be the best way to find out if you can get the things to operate properly. If that doesn't do it, then you may need some additional assistance. Thanks, Dave. Uh, from Les, uh, he would like to know, uh, on QED cycle counter, uh, do you have a, a, a version with bigger numbers on the display? Well, Les, I wish we did, because I'm one of those people that could probably take advantage of those larger numbers. Uh, but no, unfortunately, what you're looking at is a standard cycle counter. We have two versions of the cycle counter with and without a reed switch for remote measurement. But no, they're, they're all the same size in terms of the display, to my knowledge. Uh, thank you, Dave. From Ricky, uh, is there any limitation for dissolved iron concentrations beyond which AP4s would not be recommended? And what would you recommend regarding, regarding maintenance procedures for high dissolved iron? Uh, well, Ricky, I'm not aware of any maximum dissolved iron concentration that would limit the use of an AP4, AP4+. Uh, they can handle quite a bit, but what I would anticipate you're going to run into with really high dissolved iron 
and it's, it's because it's going to precipitate out inside the pump, is you're going to see this stuff building up on the pump float and the center discharge rod, and that can impede pump performance or operation over time. In terms of maintenance procedures, there's a couple of options, of course. Pulling the pumps and cleaning them by actually disassembling the pumps is one thing. Uh, the, the other possibility is something that we've been working on at QED, a number of customers are beginning to use, which is to, to put together a cleaning station at the site if you have a lot of pumps. And if this is an application where you might have a groundwater treatment system handy or whatever, we can set up one of these cleaning stations that you can actually circulate. You, you attach the pumps to an airline and discharge line, and they actually circulate a cleaning solution through the pump. So cleaning is done without having to disassemble the pump at all. And there, we're going to pick a cleaning solution that's going to be specific for being able to readily remove iron deposits from the inside of the pump. So in other words, it's probably going to be either an acid-based type of cleaning solution or something similar. Uh, I would get a hold of the folks at QED and Customer Service. There are recommended procedures for maintenance. Uh, and then from there, if you're interested in it, we'll talk a little bit more about pump cleaning and maintenance in the part two of this webinar that's going to be held next month. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, next question comes from Will. He'd like to know: Can the air safely shut off? Can the air shutoff valves be installed outside uh, because of freezing conditions, or must they be inside? Uh, well, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of air shutoff valves. There, Will. If you're talking about uh, on the airlines themselves that would provide air to 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 the well then those air shutoff valves can be installed pretty much anywhere. It wouldn't matter that they, had to be, that they would have to be outside or inside. Uh, but if that's, if that's what you're talking about, I would say it, it shouldn't be an issue either way. Obviously, anytime you're setting up a system where you anticipate freezing conditions, that's where just about anything, if it, if it can be insulated or otherwise, should be. But uh, it shouldn't be any issue otherwise. Any other questions today, Bob? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, Dave, I was uh, muted sure. there. Oh, there's Bob. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. I, I have one last question, and it comes from Kevin. Uh, he would like to know, would a top-loading pump have a higher drawdown elevation than the actua actuation level of a bottom-filling pump? Well, actually, it's, it's not. Uh, in other words, would the, would the actuation point of the pump be higher with the top inlet pump? Uh, and essentially, the actuation point of the pump is still the same, but the the minimum point to which the pump could draw down, in other words, the minimum liquid column, would definitely be higher, uh, whereas, um, you know, because the top inlet itself is the point of intake. So where is, with, with a bottom fill pump, the amount of drawdown that we can achieve in the well is the actuation point, which is going to be some point below the top of the pump itself, maybe about a third of the way down. Where the top fill pump, even though the actuation point of the pump is, is essentially where the float rises and trips the air valve mechanism, the, the actual drawdown amount that we can achieve in the well is limited by where the top inlet is positioned. So in other words, yes, the, the, the maximum drawdown point that we can achieve is going to be higher in the well than it would be with a bottom inlet pump. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, that completes the uh, Q&A uh, session of today's webinar. Uh, and it uh, brings today's program to an end. I would like to encourage everyone to please register for part two of this series, Troubleshooting and Maintenance of Air-Powered Pumps. It will be presented on Thursday, April the 4th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, please sign up at www.qedenv.com slash webinars. On behalf of QED, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Tomorrow you will receive a, an email from QED with a link to a short survey. Once the survey is completed, you'll be able to download a PDF of Dave's slides from today's presentation. Thank you, Dave, for the slideshow, and a special thanks to all of you who've joined us today. I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thanks very much, Bob, for moderating today. I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and I wish you all a pleasant afternoon.